This episode of Health Chats compiles insights by three breast cancer survivors of the different subtypes about their patient journey. Let me introduce to you triple negative breast cancer survivor, Miss Kim Lim, also the president of BCWA. Hi, Pauline. Nice to see you. Yeah, it's great to see you. Could you tell us how many years has it been since you completed treatment? So I was diagnosed in 2020 and now will be my um, second year after treatment. Right, right. And and what stage and grade of triple negative breast cancer did you actually have? So I was diagnosed with stage 3A triple negative. I see. Can you tell us a little bit more about the treatments that you had to do? So I went through lumpectomy, okay, and 16 rounds of chemotherapy with 20 rounds of radiotherapy. That That's really um, a lot. So 16 rounds of chemotherapy and 20 rounds of radiotherapy. Mm -hmm. Can you describe a little bit how that journey was for you, Kim? So uh, when I found out my lump, okay, it was three centimeter during the um, scan. And then two weeks later, I had my lumpectomy and it already grew to 4.5 centimeter. So really after my lumpectomy, I straight went for my chemotherapy. So when it started, the first second chemotherapy was still okay. I could still manage. Okay. And the third, uh, during the second chemotherapy, my hair started to drop. Right. And the third round, and I remember, I think it was the fourth round chemotherapy that I started to shave my hair bald because it was just dropping out too much. I see. That must have been yeah. very, very, very difficult. It, it was difficult. I always thought that losing hair was not that difficult. Right. Okay, before I really have to shave it off. So when I had to shave it off, my partner actually helped me to shave it off. I remembered I was actually crying. I was crying in front of the mirror. It's actually because of all the messiness, you know, everywhere on the floor, all the hair everywhere. Okay. It was just too much mess. So, but after all the crying, when it was all clean up, my hair was nice, you know, it was actually okay because it felt, you know, that it's no more messy and it was cooling and I felt liberated. You know, right. I have never gotten bored before. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, it was sad, but after that, I was getting used to it with the bored, bored hate. Right. So after that, you know, the chemo continued. Of course, yep. side effects started to come in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there was you no know, nausea. There was uh, lethargic. You know, there was neuropathy. Neuropathy. You know, a lot of side effects comes in one by one. Okay. Right. But I would have to say that because when I started the chemo, the nurse actually explained to me the side effects beforehand. Hmm. So I knew what to expect with every chemo session. Right. So you, you could mentally prepare yourself ahead of time. Correct. So I remember, you know, when I started my first chemo was actually the, what you call that, the red devil, because it's actually in the red bag. Ah, so the okay. Day, yeah. So the nurse actually explained to me already, okay. So once it's actually inserted, what would I feel? Right. So there was no shock feeling that, oh, you know, why am I feeling like that? Mm. So after that, if I have any questions, you know, with what I'm feeling that I'm not very sure, I always ask my oncologist and my breast surgeon, okay, especially my oncologist that I see very often, okay, mm -hmm. uh, is this normal? So right. I, I do read, you know, the books that was given by BCWA too. To yes. see, you know, what I'm going through is just the normal, normal things that you know, uh, that you normally encounter. Some kind so of benchmark. That, yes. So, and I also chat with the other patients and survivors. Okay, because when you go to the hospital very often, you actually meet other patients too, and also patients group. Mm. So we share information and we give each other support. Okay. Yep. That, you know, even sometimes it's very tough, you know, sometimes that you don't want to get up from bed for three days, four days, you know, you don't want to eat, okay? Mm. But we know that, you know, it will pass through. Yep. Yeah, it's just a phase that it will pass through. So when 
people ask me, you know, going through chemo, was it easy? I'll be lying to say that it was easy. Okay. Right. But it's not something that is not manageable. It's still manageable. Okay. I could see, you know, some of the patient's friends. Okay. Yep. They actually are still working. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because the first few days and then, you know, the four days, okay, you get your strength gain. So you know how to manage your timetable. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, 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 you know, it sounds like it was quite an ordeal for you, but then you, you, you as you said, understanding the cycle and which day you feel better and, and, and the whole uh, sort of the cyclical nature of each treatment and then you cope better along the way. Right. I, I, I cannot imagine what you went through and I'm glad to hear that, um, you know, the materials that BCWA had for, for you was, was helpful. And today it, it's, it's wonderful to see you serving as the president of BCWA. Yes, I think everything uh, fell into place, you know, and then, you know, I get to contribute back to the society and the other patients too. And I, I felt that during the treatment, what is actually very important is actually the circle of support system. Right. Okay, yeah. because at times, you know, when we couldn't cook, for example, you know, mm-hmm. you have your support group, the support system, whether your family or friends, okay, to actually assist you in certain things and to be there, like, you know, to listen to you, especially peer support, because they know how you feel because, you know, they, they went through the same thing or they're going through the same things. So we, we speak the same lingo. Okay, let's let's put it that way. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I have to attest to that, Kim, because we met through work, wasn't it? And I had yes, a bit yeah. of a health journey myself and Kim was a wonderful mm-hmm. um, peer support. So I, I have to attest that, you know, that, that is very valuable. Kim, if you don't mind, could you just share with us a little bit, how was it that you discovered you had breast cancer at the start? Was so, it a routine checkup or did you feel a lump? So, and during MCO, you go on emergency um, site and you see who, whichever doctor they put you to, okay? So, mm-hmm. I think I was put through a general surgeon. Right. Okay? It was a small private hospital. And the surgeon actually just touched my... Um, lung gave okay, my swollen and then and told me you know you can just get it removed today and I was like what you mean you know I can get it removed today or tomorrow you know you don't even tell me what this yep okay so um, I had a lot of question marks and I told the doctor no okay why don't you give me some medication to take Okay, so I became the doctor. Lab. So, <laughs> so he gave me five days of uh, anti-swelling medication. Okay. Right. So after five days, thankfully, the swelling went off. But the lump was so obvious. Okay. Right. It was like, you know, a, a ping pong ball. Okay. You could I actually see. see it is visible. And it was very hard, like a tennis ball. A golf right. ball, the golf ball right. part, okay. But I did not take any action. Okay. I was just like one of the females in the statistic and sat on it. Okay. Mm. I sat on it for the first month. That is because I have no family history of breast cancer. Okay. And also I was just uh gotten off my job at the period, so I don't want to face reality. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, maybe the second month when I wake up, you'll be gone. Mm. But then the third month, almost when it comes to third month, it was still there. And not only that the lump was still there, I could actually feel it growing. It was actually getting bigger. Mm. And that actually scared me. Right. So I called my GP again, and luckily his clinic was opened. So I went to see him, and when he actually touched and checked on the lump, uh, he told me, can you make an appointment to see a breast surgeon now? Mm-hmm. And I have never heard of a breast surgeon before this. Right. Okay, I don't know what to see. Then he told me, you know, call now. So actually, he was the one who persuaded me to call in front of him and make an appointment. So I called, and during pandemic, you know, even private hospital, the waiting list, the nurse told me was almost two months. I see. Then I told the nurse, I, I don't think I can wait for two months. Okay. And uh, luckily, the nurse asked me what was the reason, you know, what, what was I going through? So I explained, okay? And I could get an appointment um, 
also have to wait about two weeks. Okay. okay. So I went to see the breast surgeon. Okay. And I have to do my mammogram and ultrasound. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's when, you know, after the biopsy, okay, it became stage two. Yep. That's when, you know, uh, earlier that I mentioned, I went for my lumpectomy. And yes. then, you know, I did my sentinel biopsy, removed 24 lymph nodes, and six was with cancer. Right, right. So within a very short period of within a month, my mind of, you know, maybe it was stage one, and then, you know, biopsy stage two, and after surgery, surgery. It went to stage three. Stage three. It's, it's a lot to absorb. If you don't mind, could you just um, reiterate how quickly did your lump from side one size to the other, from three centimeters, wasn't it to 4.2? How quickly yes. was that? So when I did my mammogram, it was three centimeters. So we, in two weeks, when I did my lumpectomy, okay, but the result came out, it was already 4.5 centimeter. Right. So it grew so by more it, than 30%. Yep. When, yep. So even if there's a variance of, you know, um, you know, sizes, I, I think, you know, it is still a drastic growth from, you know, mammogram time, two weeks to, you know, the surgery. Mm. Because oh, I did definitely. my surgery within two weeks. Right. Kim, did you experience lymphedema? You had 24 notes taken out. Actually, um, of course, there's a bit of swelling, but it's not a very obvious swelling. So um, I always remember after surgery, you know, I was advised to, to do my exercise, you know, to, to ensure, you know, that there's movement. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's very important to follow that, you know, after surgery to do it diligently. So, um, you know, we were actually advised, you know, not to carry too heavy stuff too. But, you know, there's always a question, what is too heavy? So I always tell people that it's very individual. What is heavy to me might not be heavy to another person. Okay. Yeah. So I think, you know, exercise is very important to build, you know, the other strength of your body, you know, so that you can have a good balance to carry things. Mm -hmm. So I think Why for sweet? me, it's still quite uh, very well balanced. It's, it's a, bit, a bit swollen compared to my left side. Okay. Yep. But also I'm right-handed okay, compared to my left side. But it's manageable, I have to say. Did you actually do a BRCA test? Yes, I did. Uh, because I met the requirement that, you know, a profit presented below the age. Because I was diagnosed at 39. So my doctor, my oncologist actually advised me to take a genetic test at Cancer Research Malaysia. So they will run through with me, you know, the counselling, you know. What is it all about? Okay, so you have to sign an indemnity too. Okay, so after that, you know, when the result came out, the test was actually very simple because with the saliva, mm -hmm. okay, and then it was submitted for, you know, the test. And then when the result came out, the genetic counselor will actually explain to me in detail about the test because it's many pages. So right. uh, my test came out was actually BRCA negative. Right. Kim, on, he on hearing what Prof Yip just said, what does that mean for you as a triple negative survivor? You know, um, when doctor explained to me, and you always listen to talk, you know, triple negative always has the worst prognosis. Mm. Of course, it doesn't feel good. Okay. Mm. No one wants to hear that, you know, when you get the breast cancer, you got the worst type. Okay, but well, like what non Dr. Nina say, okay, we are individual. So I always tell myself, whichever, you know, whether I'm triple negative or not, it doesn't matter because I'm individual. Okay. I go through it as an individual. Okay. I will survive through it as an individual. It doesn't matter whether I'm stage three, is TN busy, it doesn't matter. So statistic to me is a statistic, but it's how do I actually overcome it and survive through it? That's more important. If I'm going to just to, you know, keep looking at the data and keep asking, that will only give me a lot of depression and that will actually make it even worse. So what I do normally is not to think about it. You know, I try to study the positive side of what I should do. Okay. Mm -hmm. The negative side, you know, it's just learning. It's just for learning purposes. 
Mm-hmm. Love, love what you just said, Kim, and, and, and you know, the, the, the approach that you are taking. And I think we will get to the positives later so that you can share with, with our audience today how, how you cope with the positives. Perhaps, Kim, you can share a little bit um, from your own perspective in your patient journey, what, what, what guided you in choosing your oncologist? So um, I get this a lot, a lot of times, so, you know, patients will ask me in the patient group, you know, who is the best surgeon or who is the best oncologist. To me as a patient, it's very important the location of the hospital, okay? Because you have to go for quite, you know, a number of treatments, so location is very important. Secondly, um, like what Dr. Nina said, the language, you need to be comfortable with your doctors, whether it's the surgeon or the oncologist, okay? Whether are you able to communicate with your doctors, is is you know sometimes you know you can feel it is that the right doctor okay so I was actually very lucky the doctor that I met the first time okay my surgeon did ask me do I want a second opinion okay but I felt very comfortable and you know uh with her so I told her no need proceed so when you know your surgeon will recommend an oncologist so when I actually met my oncologist I felt in sync you know so I guess you know every patient's right has different type of you know attitude to some like you know doctors to explain in a lengthy manner some mm-hmm. liked it straightforward mm-hmm. so there's no right and there's no wrong for myself you know I like you know my doctor because it's straight to the point so I can make decision fast okay and if I wanted to me like what Dr. Nina said an extra doctor for a second opinion is actually very good because some people can't make, some patients can't make up their mind. So to get a second opinion for and reassurance, okay, I felt that is good for some of the patients. But for my case, it was quite urgent and it was a pandemic. And, you know, I was very comfortable with both of my doctors. So things could move even faster with that. Right, right. I think that's, that's useful just to hear both sides of it. Kim, do you have anything to add about the support network? Because you talk about being positive and having that peer support. Um, yes. So a support system is so important, whether it's your family, friends, or, you know, um, patient support group. Okay. Because like what Dr. Nina said, we are so used to doing everything we can, women power, everything we can. But honestly, when you're going through your treatment, there will be downtime. There will be time that you want to give up. There will be time that you don't want to do anything. You know, it just triggers your your mental health. You know, we started the treatment feeling all positive. But let's be honest, it's a long journey. And at times, it doesn't go as planned. You know, my 16th round of chemotherapy, I thought it would add within like four months. Okay. But everything plus the 20 radiotherapy, it became seven months. Okay. Mm. That's, you know... Uh, and thought of things like my white blood cell kept dropping. So, you know, you're supposed to get your chemotherapy on that week. You have to defer another week. You know, week after week, it adds on. And this is the time where, you know, you want to speak to someone or just someone to be there. Someone to do your chores, someone to take your cats, your dogs or anything. Mm. Or sometimes just take, take your kid away. Okay. Because sometimes you just want to be alone. Sometimes you just want someone to sit in front of you even without a word. You know, that's so important to understand you without a word. Mm. You know, sometimes, you know, people tell you, you know, you can do it, you can do it, you know, but do what? You know, I'm already going through it. What else do you want me to do? Yep. Yeah. And so it's really to be less lonely as Dr. Nina said, isn't it? Yes. So, you know, patient support group is, is there because, you know, Patients are going through the same things, you know, survivors are going through the same things. So sometimes not talking, just being there is actually good enough. Right. That's good to know. That's good to know, I think, for, for everyone here who has, you know, have, has a friend who's going through breast cancer. We have um, Madam Amina Saito joining us from BCWA. So to kickstart, Madam Amina, can you just yeah. tell us your journey from diagnosis to treatment? How was that for okay. you? I was diagnosed with uh, stage one breast cancer in October 2020. So it was just the middle of a uh, pandemic. It was just in the middle of pandemic and um, it was during the regular checkup of ultrasound. 
a suspicious lump was detected. So the very next day I had biopsy and uh, a week later, I was told by my doctor that uh, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And my type of cancer was uh, hormone positive, ELPL positive. And uh, the treatment I had was, uh, first of all, I had a lumpectomy. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so the tumor was removed from my breast. And later I had the sentinel uh, lymph nodes a biopsy and uh, four lymph nodes were removed from the armpit and uh, uh, thankfully all cleared. Uh, yeah, it was not cancerous. So at the end I had the IOLT, mm -hmm. uh, radiotherapy. So uh, radiotherapy, just one session of uh, radiotherapy during the uh, surgery. Mm -hmm. So uh, after the surgery, I didn't have to have any, uh, yeah. Uh, session of radiotherapies yeah and uh, after that um, basically I've been taking uh, tamoxifen to to block the, the estrogen to yeah from the body and uh, yeah um, other than that I, I, I I'm fine I mean you know I've been still taking tamoxifen okay Madam Amina, it must be so difficult for you to have the diagnosis um, during COVID times. Um, yeah. yeah. But I wonder if you can share with us your struggles um, yeah. during during those times. Because it was like uh, 2020, October, October 2020. So even no vaccination was uh, invented yet. So mm. it was really sort of... Uh, stressful to be in mm. the hospital yeah mm. but uh, I was uh, lucky enough to go for regular checkup because I I felt something that I have to go right so I thought I shouldn't miss it and I went there and uh, yeah I was diagnosed and uh, during uh I was in the hospital. Nobody could uh, visit me, of course, obviously, only my husband. And uh, I couldn't really tell anyone because um, even if I tell, it just makes them worry and uh, they right. can't even see me. It was during the MCO and, you know, yeah. And um, yeah, and uh, even I was on the bed in the hospital. I had to wear a mask all the time. Everyone yeah. was uh, wearing masks. And yeah, yeah, it was quite uh, stressful. And uh, really, I wasn't sure what's going on, you know, and uh, always uh, feel anx uh, anxious and uncertain about things. Gosh, um, I cannot imagine so, you know, battling with the diagnosis of cancer during the best of time and then you have to battle on top of having COVID restrictions yeah, during yes, that time. Yes, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, obviously I was feeling weak and at the same time I have to worry about what if I get COVID, you know. So mm. yeah. Uh, yeah, it was quite depressing Yeah, during that time, I remember, yeah. Mm. Madam Amina, thank you so much for sharing um, your journey of diagnosis to treatment. For you, um, Amina, did you get much side effects from tamoxifen? Um, yeah, it's like a menopausal symptom, so like a hot flush and a body ache, and sometimes I get very moody, you know, emotional. Mm -hmm. But um, it was like beginning of the time that I was I started to take tamoxifen, and then after a few months, it got quite stable. And also, mm -hmm. I started. That's when I started to do some exercise, and uh, yeah, I make myself active. So, like now, I don't really find any problem. Yeah, that's good to know. Madam Nell Farrow Rosie, her two survivor and vice president of Breast Cancer Welfare Association. Let's welcome Nell. Hi, Pauline. Hello, Nell. Good to see Hi, you. Nell. Can you share with us a little bit of a little bit about your patient journey? I mean, let's start with how long has it been since you finished your treatment? 
Um, okay. Actually, I have just completed my last treatment in June, just uh, three months ago. Wow. So it's, you just finished it. It was really um, recent. Yes. Now, what grade and stage of HER2 breast cancer did you have? Mine was uh, stage uh, 2B and grade 3, um, HER2 positive breast cancer um, with, um, I think it's, a, it's called a high TI67, like 60-70%. Uh, I mean, so um, according to my oncologist, I have a higher chance of recurrence. I'm sorry to hear so that. So my treatment... Uh, yeah, my, my treatment is pretty long. It has been three years, actually. I was diagnosed in February uh, 2020. Right. Yeah. And what sort of treatments have you had to do? Okay. I I did like four cycles of uh, EC chemo, followed by 12 cycles of paclitaxel chemotherapy, and 15 fractions of radiotherapy. And followed by 18 cycles of septin targeted therapy. And finally, uh, I took neratinib targeted oral chemo for a year. That's like that's like 12 cycles. I see. Yeah. What would you say has been the most difficult struggle for you now in, in this whole journey? I mean, it's so long. It's been three years, as you said. Yes. Uh it well, um, because my journey, you know, has been pretty long uh, there has been many side effects um you know apart from the nausea uh well hair loss and all that i suffered from diarrhea like you know for the entire 3 years what sort of surveillance have you been asked to do now on on surveillance now that you finished treatment 3 months ago um basically i need to do my mammogram my annual mammogram uh, and uh, follow up with the breast surgeon every six months. And uh, I also do follow up with the oncologist every two or three months. Yeah, and PET scan. And how often? Uh, it's annual. What are we supposed to eat after surgery or ke after chemotherapy? You know, uh, I just want to share. I, I uh, listened to a talk recently by um, this doctor, uh, Dr. Aniza. Uh, she mentioned that, you know, uh, food, uh, what, what we eat, right, only affect 5%, right? I mean, basically the recurrence, whatever, only 5% uh, um, risk or something like that. You know, more often, uh, you know, in cancer patients, right, mm -hmm. they are more in danger of malnutrition rather than, you know, eating the wrong food. So they're afraid to eat everything, you know, they don't eat. <laughs> So Nell, thank you for that. That's a very good point. And if you're doing treatment, you need to eat rather than be malnourished, isn't it? And you are the Vice President of BCWA. I think this would yes, be a great correct. time as well to just put a plug for BCWA, who's the partner of Talk Health Asia in this campaign. How has BCWA supported you in your journey? Okay. When when I was going um when I was going through my treatment, you know, I was looking for uh some support groups, you know, because you know, uh I always hear in the US they have so many support group for cancer patients, and I was looking for one in Malaysia, and I I stumbled upon BCWA, so I attended their group counseling sessions. Uh, it was during the MCO, so they had it online. So I attended the online sessions. I I find that it, it has been very helpful because you know I get to meet uh cancer patients. I mean breast cancer patients, um you know from not just her too, but you know, other types of breast cancer and uh, some have finished their treatment uh, recently, some are under treatment and some have completed like, you know, long time ago. Mm -hmm. And and I hear their stories, their journeys and I, I, you know, I feel, okay, this is not too bad. You know, at least I know I'm not alone in fighting this uh, illness and it has, uh, it, hel it has um, inspired me. Um, in my entire journey. Click subscribe on Talk Health Asia's YouTube channel and watch the Health Chat series explaining different breast cancer subtypes. Don't forget to also check out talkhealthasia.com.